Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures Daily Dose of Nature. Today's topic, At Home and Abroad in Antarctica. Presented by NADHAB Expedition Leader, Daniel Stavert. I'm your host, Rob Mess. Thank you all so much for joining us here today. Over to you, Daniel. Well, hi, everybody, and uh, welcome to this uh, fantastic webinar. Uh, my name is Daniel Stavert, and I'll be talking to you about Antarctica and uh, particularly the Natural Habitat Adventures trips that we do there uh, in the, the uh, summer, well, my summer, and your winter uh, at the end of this year. Uh, so our, our topic today is uh, at home and abroad in Antarctica. And we'll be talking about uh, what it's like to travel down there and to live down there uh, and what we do uh, on our trips. Uh, so firstly, I should just introduce myself. Uh, there's a photograph of me in the sunshine. Uh, my name is Daniel Stavert. Uh, I'm down here in currently dark uh, Tasmania, uh, the uh, southernmost point of Australia. And you can hear the kookaburras in the, the trees outside as the, uh, the dawn comes in. Uh, I, I live uh, on the southern point of Tasmania uh, in Australia. And just about 20 miles to the south of me is the most southerly point of Australia. And below that uh, is the Southern Ocean. And below the Southern Ocean is Antarctica. So there's not much between me uh, and, and the south. Uh, I'm an expedition leader. Uh, I've been working uh, in the polar world for the last 10 years. I first went down in 2014 uh, on ships. And of course, I've been guiding as a kayak guide and a climbing guide and an outdoor guide uh, since 2002, about 20 years now, which has gone really, really quickly. Uh, and I really love these trips. I love guiding in the polar world. Uh, and hopefully by the end of the presentation, you'll, you'll see why. So here we go. Uh, let's talk about uh, our trip in Antarctica. Let's talk about what we do and what we see and, and why I think it's a fantastic uh, place to, to travel. Uh, so, uh, I'm going to begin by, by running through a few things. So, uh, obviously, photography uh, is an easy one in Antarctica. You put your camera somewhere and amazing things pop out, just like this example. Uh, so, firstly, we're talking about uh, unique Antarctica. And I think Antarctica is a truly unique place to go uh, and to be. And afterwards, we'll discuss... I'm going to fix my screen one second. Yep. Uh, then we'll talk about traveling in Antarctica, uh, how we get there. And that's, of course, a lot of logistics and a lot of the questions that I'm anticipating uh, people asking about travel here uh, is how we get there. Uh, it is the most remote place on the planet. Uh, there are no towns. There are uh, very, very few, with small exceptions, uh, airports. Uh, and so how we get there, how we travel around uh, is a huge part of our our travel, it's about uh, of our questions. Uh, and then finally, um, we'll talk about once we're there, once we're at home in Antarctica, uh, what do we do when we are there? What are we gonna actually do? After all the effort, after all the travel, after all the, uh, the movement it's taken to get to the other side of the world. Uh, so unique Antarctica. Uh, this is a fantastic little map. Uh, and I love maps, I love charts. And if you were to travel with me to Antarctica, uh, we would every evening pull out the chart and we would dig through where we've been and then the history behind the names and the stories. Uh, I really love how uh, you can look at I, these maps to me are the history of humans discovering the place. Uh, and this is a map. Um, oh, here we go. This is a map that was uh, made in the early 1600s. And if you look at the map, uh, you can see, of course, uh, little bits of South America. You can see uh, South Africa, uh, Nova Hollandia, which of course is New Holland, which became Australia, uh, is still uh, in the shadows. It's still unclear. And then right in the middle is terra incognita. So in the 1600s, humans had this huge gap in their knowledge of the planet, this massive hole in our understanding. Uh, and much earlier, uh, it had been theorized that there had to be something down there. Even Aristotle himself had theorized there had to be a continent down there. Um, if there wasn't a big continent on the southern part of the, of the globe, then the whole globe would tip over under the weight of the northern hemisphere. Um, and this theory was called the counterweight continent, if you can believe it. Uh, it's actually a true story. Uh, so this is this map with this big gap in the middle. 
And these little lines you can see are the theorized coastlines. Sailors had thought maybe there was something down there and they'd theorized some coastlines. Uh, but about 150 years later, everyone's friend, Captain James Cook turns up uh, and he drives all the way around Antarctica and sees nothing. And if you can see at this map here, this chart, there's a fantastic little squiggly yellow line. And that yellow line is, is James Cook's journey. Uh, and he went all the way around Antarctica and his mission was to see it and he never actually saw it, uh, unfortunately. Uh, however, he did map more thoroughly uh, New Holland, New Zealand, uh, these places. Um, and you can just see uh, where I'm at, which is on the very, very southern end of what they call New Holland there. Uh, but the map is starting to fill in. Here's, here's James Cook's map, a bit closer up so you can see it. That yellow line there is his journey in 1772. And here he is looking stern. And he said, uh, he said he had gone uh, not only further than any man who has gone before me, but as far as I think it is possible for man to go. Uh, so he's a bit of a sore loser, uh, perhaps you might say. Um, if you could go further than him, well, that's another thing. Um, even if you could go further south, you might have the honor of discovery, but I'll be bold to say that the world would not be benefited from it. Um, I think he was incorrect. I think if you do go further than Captain James Cook, uh, then you will be benefited from it. And this presentation is really all about that. But uh, he was the guy uh, who uh, mapped where Antarctica wasn't. But everyone respected James Cook so much, they thought, well, if he can't do it, uh, nobody can. And it took another almost 100 years uh, for another pressure to drive people south to try and find Antarctica. And in this case, it was commerce and science. Uh, so Nathaniel Palmer, uh, the first American uh, to come south, uh, was a sealer, a very young man, actually, uh, in his 20s. Uh, and he came south and started finding seals for the, the burgeoning seal trade. And then Belsinghausen was a Russian navigator whose hero was Cook. Uh, and he came down to try and navigate uh, for science's sake. And I think that kind of sets up the modern uh, discussion about Antarctica, which has really been the commerce versus science debate. And perhaps that's something we can talk about a lot more while sitting on board a boat uh, down there. And history progresses at pace uh, and the national programs start arriving. And uh, the Belgica, the Belgians, they were very national. And then of course, Charcot, the French, they were very scientific. And I love this photograph, um, being as French as they possibly can be, uh, berets and champagne on the ice uh, in the early 20th century. And all of that frantic discovery, the science, the commerce, uh, the navigation that those fantastic explorers did uh, led us to this uh, overview of Antarctica now that we can see. And we know the shape of it. We can see it from the satellite. It's well uh, charted. Uh, however, uh, knowing a place on a map is very, very different to, to traveling there. So uh, this is another chart, another map that I find fantastic. Um, it's actually a political map. Uh, this is the map of the Antarctic Treaty. Uh, and what's super interesting about Antarctica is, is that nobody owns it. And I wager that it's probably the only place uh, any of us have ever been in the whole world uh, where nothing is owned, where the land itself doesn't belong to any person. And that's a unique thing. Uh, I certainly hadn't been anywhere like that until we went to Antarctica. Uh, once you cross the 60th parallel, once we sail across or fly across a 60 degree line in the ocean, you are now under the auspices of the Antarctic Treaty. Uh, and the Antarctic Treaty is this document signed by uh, a great number of nations. Uh, and basically it says this place is free for all people, for peace and science. Uh, and it's a remarkable and unique landscape in the world. And the next interesting thing about that same line in, in the ocean, that 60 degree line, is it roughly mimics a, a really interesting biological phenomenon called the Antarctic Convergence. And that's the coming together of Southern Ocean waters and Southern Atlantic and Pacific waters. And over about a kilometer or three quarters of a mile, uh, sorry, yeah, about three of a mile, sorry, uh, in the ocean, uh, the temperature of the ocean will change by, you know, up to eight degrees Celsius, uh, which is in Fahrenheit. I can't do that. You'll have to put that in the questions. That's quite a hard question for me. 
Um, but it changes really dramatically. You can even see the difference. You can see the fog over the ocean. It's like a wall of fog over the ocean as you sail into it. Uh, and that's the temperature change of the air. And you are crossing into a different biosphere over only a couple of kilometers in the ocean. Above the ocean, above that line is the South Atlantic and the Pacific. And below that line is the Antarctic climate. And that barrier, that temperature barrier, keeps the north out and keeps the south in and makes Antarctica this incredibly separate place in the world. So crossing over the Drake Passage uh, from South America to Antarctica or Australia to Antarctica, you cross into a very, very different place. And here it is. Uh, this is a, a map, uh, again, uh, of uh, the Scotia Sea. And the Scotia Sea in this place is the localised version of the Southern Ocean. And just to the north there is South America. And you can see Terra del Fuego and Patagonia and all those wonderfully glamorous places uh, up on the north, uh, the left-hand side of your screen. And then the Antarctic Peninsula, uh, which is just sticking up into the ocean there. And uh, if you can imagine you know, a fist and a thumb, uh, the main body of Antarctica is your fist and the thumb is the Antarctic Peninsula. And that's where we will be spending our time uh, on our journey and indeed in this, this webinar. Uh, so the peninsula there, the Antarctic Peninsula, uh, is is our focus, and it sticks up into the Southern Ocean, uh, and separating separated from the rest of the world by the Drake Passage. So that's the the build up. Uh, I hope you're all excited because uh, we are going to talk more about Antarctica. But here we get into some of the nuts and bolts. Uh, traveling to Antarctica, how do we get there? We know that James Cook sailed around the place and couldn't find it. Uh, we know that for hundreds and hundreds of years, it was an incredibly difficult proposition to sail across the, the Drake Passage uh, uh, and to get to Antarctica. Uh, these days, uh, it's much easier. Uh, it's still a challenge. Uh, weather forecasting has been the main thing that's made it easy. We can now leave South America uh, on a good forecast with only you know, two or three days of travel to get south and we can zip in between storm systems. Uh, in the olden days, that was not possible, hence the, the stories of remoteness and wildness. By traveling to Antarctica, uh, we come across a few of our first choices because we have the Drake separating and in our way. So on our on Nat Hab trips, so natural habitat uh, adventure trips, uh, we always stage ourselves uh, in South America. So in the amazing Tierra del Fuego, and you see this, it's an incredibly dramatic landscape. It is the southern edge of the Andes and these nice sharp mountains and glaciers uh, rising up into the landscape. And the foothills of these mountains are covered in beautiful uh, native birch or nothophagus trees, which make for a beautiful forest to walk amongst. Uh, we will be spending uh, a full day uh, in Terra del Fuego at the start of the trip. And that's for a number of reasons. Uh, firstly, it's to uh, allow any flight connections that might have troubles uh, to resolve themselves, maybe baggage issues to resolve themselves. And we do find in South America that there are occasional issues. Uh, so we spent a full day there in Tierra del Fuego. And in that day, uh, we will be going for a walk in the forest, testing our rain gear, making sure we're ready, uh, any last minute purchases, uh, any of those kind of things. Um, uh, we'll also be meeting our group uh, and getting a feel for each other and getting ourselves ready to go south. Uh, another reason we have this day uh, is because we don't really know when the best moment to leave is. Maybe we're sailing south. We need another extra day in our buffer just to be sure when the best moment to leave is. Maybe we're flying south uh, and the flights themselves are as unpredictable as well, any unpredictable thing. Uh, they're watching the weather as keenly as any one of us to find the window of calm to fly across the Drake. So we spend a full day here at Terra Fuego, um, and I think it's an amazing experience. Uh, when I travel south, it's so great to be connected to the full story of travellers. And for hundreds and hundreds of years, sailors, explorers, uh, scientists have been pausing before they travel, pausing before they leap, uh, before they leave the developed, the civilized, the known, they pause on the edge and then jump. And that is something that we 
need to do too. And that connection with other explorers and sailors, uh, I think is wonderful. Uh, so we'll spend that day there walking, talking, we'll go to a few museums. Uh, if you're leaving from Punta Arenas, uh, then we can go to a couple of fantastic little museums that talk about Southern exploration. Um, and Ushuaia in Argentina uh, has the same or a similar uh, facilities. A couple of fantastic museums that really get us thinking about Antarctica and being uh, on the verge. And both these, these towns, Punta Arenas and Ushuaia, uh, call themselves the gateway to Antarctica. And it, it really is for us the beginning. Uh, so I encourage folk to embrace that time in South America because it is the gateway to our experience. And then uh, some of us might sail uh, or some of us might fly in these fantastic uh, short jump aeroplanes. And uh, I'll get to in, uh, in a moment about the different options you have for travel here. But this is the, the aeroplane, uh, one of two, uh, which is fantastically painted to get you in the spirit. And essentially, uh, if you are flying to Antarctica, uh, then we are jumping across the Drake and we are flying to the South Shetlands, uh, which is, I'll, I'll show a chart in a second, an island chain just north of the peninsula. Excuse me. The flight is about two to three hours. Uh, it's not, not that far, it's a very fast plane. Uh, very deliberately, they they want to get across quickly, and then when we land, you'll see why it's called a short jump, because uh, it lands on the shortest runway you can possibly imagine. Uh, you touch down, and then the plane has stopped. Uh, it's quite remarkable. Uh, the flight uh, is not uh, a particularly comfortable one. Uh, there is uh, snacks and those things served, but it's really not your typical airline, and that's part of the fun. Uh, and all around us in the plane will be uh, scientists, uh, maybe filmmakers, uh, some other tourists perhaps uh, coming in, but it's quite an amazing experience to be amongst the different adventurers that are coming to Antarctica. And the, the airstrip is there, it's part of uh, a Chilean base, uh, which is on that island of, of, of King George Island, which of course has the most bases of any place in Antarctica, because it is the most accessible. Uh, so once you land, we get to walk through Chile, we get to walk through Russia, we to walk through South Korea, uh, all the way, and Poland, uh, all the way down to the beach where we meet our, our boat uh, and away we go. So we have different options for travel. Uh, so leaving from South America, there's different ways to get south. Uh, and we use this fantastic fly sail, fly fly kind of way of thinking about it. So the first is uh, a fly sail. And basically that means what it says. That is to fly across the Drake, have our adventure, and then sail back across the Drake. And then the middle one there is to fly, fly, and that means you fly both ways. Uh, and then the last one is to sail, fly. That is to arrive by boat and leave by plane. I think they all have merits. Uh, I think you know you have to think about what you would like to do with your your time. Uh, if you are worried about the Drake, if you're worried about motion sickness and those kind of things, uh, then flying is definitely a good choice. Uh, it removes that worry. Uh, and worry to me is, is the thing that I try and avoid in this regard. Uh, if you choose to sail, uh, the sail experience is not just a, you know, a, a grin and bear it experience. It's actually an amazing experience because uh, the Drake is, whilst forbidding uh, and whilst it is, notorious as a rough body of water. It's also, a, again, I love talking about unique things. It's also a very, very unique place. The Southern Ocean is an ocean that runs all the way around the world. And when sailors look at the ocean, uh, they look at how far the wind can travel over the water before it touches land. Um, and every time the wind touches land or the water touches land, it loses some power. Okay, it loses its ability to work the water up into a, a big state. Uh, and the Southern Ocean is the only ocean that has an infinite distance the wind can travel. It can go right around the globe without ever stopping, without ever being affected by land. And it just brushes the edges of Patagonia, of Tasmania, of New Zealand. Uh, and that 
body of ocean, because of that infinite capacity to generate wind and weather, of course, is the home to some really unique creatures. So that crossing allows us to observe uh, the albatross. Uh, and in this case, is a grey-headed albatross, uh, one of the smaller albatrosses in the world, uh, at around uh, seven to eight feet across the wingspan. Okay, about 220 centimetres. It's about seven and a half, yeah, about eight feet uh, across the wingspan. Smaller on the scale of these birds. Uh, and they are masters of flight. And they are wonderful things to watch from the back deck as we cruise along. This is the wandering albatross, just a, a young fellow. Uh, this is a young wandering albatross. This is the biggest, or well, the largest uh, wingspan flying bird in the world. Uh, being measured up to three, 300, 365 centimetres, uh, which is getting in towards uh, 14 feet or so, 13 feet. Uh, which is, if you look in your kitchen right now, and put one wing against the wall, and then see how far that goes. Uh, it's like having a small aeroplane in your, in your house. Uh, that's the largest by wingspan flying bird in the world. And being in their world, in their zone, uh, is a privilege. So the Drake is, is not an empty space. It's a place where we can watch unique creatures live. And they don't live anywhere else in the world. There's nowhere else in the world that has the capacity to generate the wind uh, like the Drake does. And little fellows too, like this fantastic Cape Petrel, uh, which the Argentinians and the Spanish speakers call Pintado, which means the painted. And you can see why the beautiful checkerboard on its back is a fantastic ship followers. They'll come follow us for days and days and days. So the crossing is uh, between two and three days if we're in our, our fantastic little boat. And it is a great time just to slow down and prepare yourself for arriving in Antarctica or to slow down and process what we've experienced. And I love the Drake. Um, uh, but I do recognise that some people aren't comfortable at sea. I myself do get seasick. Um, I have to manage it quite carefully. Uh, so I do recognise that. Um, and so the fly fly idea um, is also a fantastic thing. We do get a day on the Bransfield Strait, um, which again I'll show on a map in a minute. Um, and so you do get some of this ocean experience, uh, some of the albatross. Uh, you definitely get the Cape Petrel, the Pintado here. Uh, even if you do the fly fly, you will see some of these creatures. So you get a, a mini drake, so to speak, as you cross the Bransfield Strait from the Shetlands down to the Antarctic Peninsula proper. And then this is what we're all waiting for. It's our arrival in Antarctica. And whether you arrive uh, by plane, uh, whether you arrive by boat, that first moment when you realise that you've crossed that line and you've, you've arrived in the south, uh, and you've seen terra incognita, you've seen terra australis. It's quite an impactive moment. Uh, and one of the things that I've noticed over the years is that folk are surprised by a number of things, but one of them is, is how big it is. So many of our documentaries that we see are of uh, the ice shelf, uh, you know, with the penguins uh, coming and going. Uh, and the ice shelf is not quite where we're at. We're in the Antarctic Peninsula, uh, and we're looking at these huge mountain ranges that you know, rear off into the distance uh, and massive glaciers coming down to the sea. And so your first sight of Antarctica, it's a big thing. And in a perfect universe, we'd arrive just like this trip uh, in the sunrise uh, and things would be glowing on the mountains and the up and glow on the ice uh, and the magic would have already begun. So the vessels that we take, and we do use vessels, we are uh, using small boats. And the reason we use ships and boats is because, well, there are no towns for us to stay in. Uh, the stations, the scientific stations have no room for us. Um, they're very busy anyway, um, so we can't stay with them. Uh, and of course, we won't be able to move around and see a lot of things. There's, it's very hard to get ashore at Antarctica. Uh, we find lots of good places, we find lots of activities, but you can't build a town there or have roads or anything like that. They just wouldn't survive. Uh, it's one of the cool things about the place is that this is a place where humanity is not able to develop those kind of civilizations, those kind of communities, and therefore we have to explore in a different way. So we use boats. Um, and we use uh, three boats at the moment. Um, and I'm going to show all three of them and talk about the differences between, uh, between them. 
And I would group these first two in roughly the same category, the Ocean Tramp and the Australis. And then the third boat I'll talk about in a moment when we get to it. This is the Ocean Tramp. And as you can see, she's a, a beautiful vessel. Uh, she was the, uh, the pride and joy of a very famous climber called Charlie Porter, who you might have heard of if you're a climber, perhaps. Uh, he was famous for doing uh, polar uh, climbs around the world in Greenland and the Antarctic. Um, and then when he passed, his boat was sold. Uh, and then it was bought uh, by a fantastic group of people who run it. Um, and we use it for this trip uh, in, in, the, in the Southern Ocean. And she's a purpose-built Southern Ocean sailing craft, uh, steel reinforced, uh, twin mastered. Um, and we do actually sail it occasionally. Uh, we use the motor a lot, but we do sail. And she sails beautifully. I actually find it more comfortable when she's sailing than when she's under, under engine. Some of the practicalities. So when we talk about sailboats, uh, sailboats, well, they're designed for sailing uh, and they're designed for moving through the water. They're not necessarily designed for us to be comfortable. Uh, so if you are thinking about uh, coming on board the sailboats, um, and that's these first two boats that I'm talking about, uh, you do need to be aware that your mobility needs to be up to it. Uh, so this is a fantastic uh, sequence of photos of us getting on and off. Here we go. You can see an intrepid Nathab Explorer uh, climbing down the, the, the rungs and stepping into the boat here into the little zodiac we use. And we use these little tenders to get ashore or to go exploring, and I'll discuss that in a second. Um, but you can see it takes a bit of mobility. It takes a bit of being able to climb down a ladder, being able to swing your head under a, a steel bar uh, and you know, slide yourself back into the, the vessel here uh, where Simon is there uh, waiting to welcome you with open arms. Uh, in the, the Zodiac tender. Uh, so mobility is definitely a, a factor in our choices. Uh, additionally, on board inside, and I'll show you some inside photos of, of these vessels in a moment, um, but additionally inside the boat, uh, you know, quarters are, are fairly cramped. Uh, we live very closely together. And you can see here, this is a schematic of the, of the ship. And you can see the different berths you, you might uh, get a chance to, to sleep in. Um, you know, you can see cabins one, two, three, and four. Uh, those are the cabins, so they're twin share cabins, um, either with a, a partner or perhaps uh, an, another traveler. Um, and if you feel like your, like your bunk is cramped, try and find the guide bunk. And it's just there, just next to the engine room. Um, and it's actually a repurposed bookshelf. Uh, it's actually, the, it, it, not a word of a lie, it's the bookshelf. They took all the books out, put a mattress in it, uh, and that's where the guide sleeps. So uh, I find it quite cozy, especially when the boat's moving and you, you can't really move very much when you're wedged in between you know, the dictionary and the sailing guide. Uh, so that's quite handy. Uh, but that's the inside there. Uh, you can see the galley, the main saloon. Uh, quarters are cramped, uh, but uh, it is the, the, the right vessel for the job. Uh, here's our second uh, sail vessel we use. So this is the SV Australis. Uh, and it's uh, captained by an Australian fellow uh, called Ben Wallace, who's a good friend of mine uh, and a fantastic sailor. He's been coming down to the Antarctic for over 20 years uh, and knows the peninsula better than anybody I know. Uh, and it's a real privilege to sail with him because uh, he knows the place and I, I work with him to, to decide where we go. Uh, the Australis is a fantastic steel hulled uh, sailing vessel, just like the Ocean Tramp. Uh, she's a tiny bit more spacey uh, in storage and in capacity, uh, a bit more of a flush deck, um, a bit more of a, a motor sailor perhaps um, than the, uh, the, the Ocean Tramp. Um, however, it's pretty similar quarters inside. You can see uh, it looks kind of like a hotel out of the 80s perhaps. Um, and that's the decor kind of standard where we're looking for here. Um, but both of these, these ships, both of these yachts, uh, it's an expedition feel. And what I mean by that is, is that we are living together, we are traveling together, we're making decisions together, uh, we talk about our, our trip together, and we live in quite close quarters. Another really cool thing about it is, uh, is the small crew. Uh, so on these sail vessels, we have up to three crew, a captain, a mate, and a cook. Uh, and all three of those people will do all three of those jobs. Uh, the captain is not above uh, cooking his breakfast. 
Uh, I'm there as the expedition leader. I occasionally feel a bit extra because uh, the captains uh, and the crew are so fantastic, um, but that's really, really quite great. Uh, so I work with those three, three people uh, to make the trip happen. Um, but the privilege for me is, is that on these boats, uh, there really is no crew space. There really is no guest space. There's just the space. And in opposition to perhaps a large vessel with 100 or 200 or 300 passengers, you know, we get to be with the crew and share their experience. And, and my experience is, is that they love it. They love seeing uh, the place through your eyes uh, and they love sharing their experience and what they're doing. Uh, some of the other things they do on the ship might include science or uh, filming for documentaries. I know the Australis just wrapped filming a bunch of things with a bunch of streaming platforms you might know. Uh, so if you keep your eyes out on your various platforms, uh, you might see the Australis uh, in those films, which is pretty fun. Uh, so the small crew part of it is actually one of the highlights. And it's funny to think that going all the way to Antarctica to see a penguin, perhaps, uh, and you come back and the highlight is a conversation you had with the captain one midnight on a transit when you were both awake and, and he was driving the boat. You just chatted him and drank coffee for an hour. But that is the highlight for some people, is talking boats with the captain at midnight. Uh, so the people component can't be underrated on expeditions. And here we are uh, doing some activities. And that's the Australis, uh, deep where she belongs uh, in the ice. And you can probably see me somewhere in there. Actually, no, I think I'm taking the photograph in this one. This is us getting our kayaks ready. Uh, and our extra vessel, our third vessel, is the MV Hansa Explorer. Uh, and as you can see, it is a slightly bigger vessel. It's definitely a motor vessel uh, rather than a sail vessel. And she takes up to 12 passengers. And I should say the two sailing vessels are six to seven guests. Uh, this one here, up to 12. Uh, the crew ratio goes right up. It's act, in fact, almost one to one, in fact. Uh, we have crew, we have cabin uh, stewards, um, cook, uh, that kind of thing, um, mate, and a naturalist who gets to work with myself on board. So there's two people talking to you about the wildlife. So it's a, a step up in terms of uh, ratios of crew. You do get a bit more separation with the crew, unfortunately, um, as a consequence, but you still obviously have good interactions with them. Um, and as you can see from the photographs, uh, it's a bit of a different life on board, perhaps to the sailing vessels. Uh, it's much more comfortable. Uh, it's much more accessible. There's much more modern amenities. Um, there are more people looking out for your, your needs. Um, and certainly uh, the challenges of getting on and off the boat getting in and out of zodiacs, et cetera, is uh, significantly reduced. Uh, you still get to go to similar places. You still have all the nimbleness of a, a small boat. You can get into those little nooks and crannies. Um, according to our logistics planning, uh, we are still defined as a small boat, that's 12 passengers or less. And therefore we have freedom of movement around the peninsula that perhaps a larger vessel wouldn't have as it has to operate under a very different set of guidelines uh, under the Antarctic Treaty. So under 12 passengers, we have a lot of freedom. So it has a very similar level of freedom of movement uh, to the other two boats. It has more comfort. It perhaps has a bit less of the expedition uh, altogether kind of feel uh, that the, uh, the sailboats have. Um, if you ask me, I don't know what I prefer. I like the kind of the, the rougher kind of things. I like that more intimate kind of feeling, uh, but I also do recognize how comfort uh, can allow us to be feel comfortable and safe uh, and deal with our, our bodily needs. And then that allows us to be relaxed. And once you're relaxed, you feel at home. And once you're at home in Antarctica, uh, you get to explore it and be more open to it. Uh, so in that regard, uh, I can highly recommend any of these three vessels or any of these three trips. They could do go to the same places. Uh, we will run roughly the similar itineraries. So at home in Antarctica, those are the vessels, that's the travel, and we've arrived in Antarctica, uh, and here we are. And I love this photograph because it just kind of shows me uh, the scale of things. There's the Australis tucked in a nook right at the back of everything, uh, in a deep in a bay. And this is in Mikkelsen Harbour behind De Hino Island, which I, I don't speak French, I can't pronounce, but that's the name of the island. Um, 
And so here we are tucked right in the way there. One of the best things about Antarctica is, you know, I'm gonna show you activities and wildlife in a moment. Um, but my favorite thing is at the end of the day, getting a cup of tea and sitting on top of the wheelhouse with my back against the Zodiac uh, and just watching it all happen after dinner with a cup of tea. Uh, that's my favorite thing. Here we are again, tucked away in the landscape. Um, so what do we do uh, when we're in Antarctica? Well, firstly, we travel and we look around. Uh, and this is a, an itinerary. This is a, a chart from a previous trip. Um, and I keep on saying that it's an itinerary. We don't really have an itinerary. Uh, you might be on a previous NatHab trip where they can tell you day one, day two, day three, where we'll be. Um, I know that we will arrive in Antarctica, maybe on, in this case, the 2nd of January. We might arrive on the 3rd or the 4th or the 1st. Uh, it just depends on the weather. Uh, so we might have an extra day in Punta Arenas. We might have an extra day at sea. We might have less than a day, you know, arrive in Punta Arenas and pack our bags and go straight away. Um, you never know. The plan changes the minute you start the trip. Uh, and in this case, you can see our journey was roughly south for the first few days. And we visited some fantastic islands and landings. And we got to our furthest south point, just past the Lemaire Channel, before we turned and kept exploring uh, on our way back up to King George Island at the top of the map there, where the number one is. Uh, and Maxwell Bay is the name of the little tiny bay there. So that's what we're doing. We're moving and traveling. And on the way, we get to meet the locals. So uh, I dare you to take a bad photograph of a penguin. It's pretty hard to do. Uh, these are two Gentoo penguins. Uh, you can see that they're, they're just out of the water. And I can tell that because they're lovely and clean uh, because of uh, not being in the colony with, with the chicks, but also the red flush under their wings tells me how warm they are from being in the water. Okay, the water is it's warm for them, um, even if it is uh, close to freezing for us. Uh, that pink flush, just like the flush to your face after you've done a run or, or many push-ups, like I'm sure we all do. Uh, there are some big creatures too. Uh, and the Antarctic Peninsula is the prime feeding ground uh, for all the humpback whales uh, of the South America uh, and that part of the Pacific and the Atlantic. Uh, so humpback whales feed in Antarctica and then they come north to breed back in South America and other places and don't, don't eat a thing for six months. But whilst they're in Antarctica, they are gorging. They are feeding as much as they can. You can see on the bottom left there, uh, this big bubble net feeding going on uh, and the beautiful humpback wing on the top. And then of course the playful behavior of breaching on the, on the right hand side of your screen. So big whales coming on through. And we see humpback whales in large numbers, thankfully larger and larger numbers uh, as humpback whales seem to have recovered almost completely uh, from uh, our, uh, our depredations of an earlier time perhaps. Uh, so uh, they've recovered almost totally. We see other whales too, um, perhaps in less numbers, but they are pretty cool. Uh, these are some of my favorites, elephant seals. Uh, and they are just gloriously, excessively disgusting. Uh, big, smelly, amazing animals that just roll around the beach, uh, you know, watching you with these big, lazy eyes. And on the right, we've got a male hiding amongst a bit of tussock, okay? Uh, this was taken in some of the sub-Antarctic islands. Uh, and then uh, to the left, uh, you've got uh, some juveniles and his skin's just molting off there, uh, which is why he looks so particularly endearing today. And then of course, we have some very charismatic megafauna that if you're lucky enough to see, uh, we have our killer whales here. Uh, and this is a, an ecotype. A, a, we're still debating whether it's a subspecies there or a different species, I should say but they call it an ecotype these days. This is a type B killer whale. And you can tell by the, the saddle patch, you can just see the faint line across its back. Uh, very different to the Northern hemisphere killer whales you might be more used to uh, behaviorally uh, and also in, in shape and color. We all think a killer whale, same, same, but they're actually quite different. And uh, if we see them, which we uh, don't see them every trip, but I would say it's not uncommon to have an amazing killer whale experience like this one. But of course, uh, folk, who come for the wildlife, the penguins, uh, almost always leave having fallen in love with the ice. Uh, and icebergs are incredible things. The beautiful lines, uh, the architecture. And this is a, 
a little photograph, not a photo, this is a painting. I didn't make this, this was made in 1912. Uh, and I, I like talking about the connection with the past. This is uh, a painting uh, by Edward Wilson, who was a very famous traveler and an artist uh, and or ornithologist, I should say, uh, who traveled with Scott. Uh, and he uh, painted this to try and get across the feel of the place. Um, and I, I love it because it really just gets across that moody uh, pastel kind of colors. And uh, you know, when we're there, you know, we'll be deep in this landscape, uh, walking amongst it, uh, enjoying uh, this kind of feel and mood uh, with all that wildlife around. So what do we do? That's what we can see. What do we do? Uh, on the left here, you can see us in our uh, luxury vessel. Uh, this is a little uh, zodiac. Uh, and we're all aboard here. We're going to go land on the ice straight ahead. And we're pushing our way through this beautiful brash ice. And that's Captain Ben on the tiller, uh, pushing us through the ice to get us ashore uh, on the ice there. And then on the right, uh, getting off the zodiac onto the ice. And you can see, again, there is a, there is a mobility requirement. Um, we do need to be able to move ourselves uh, from the pontoon of that zodiac uh, onto the ice there. Uh, and then to walk through the snow and walking poles, which are uh, either bring your own or provided we do bring a whole bunch with us, um, are very helpful in this regard because it is slippery and a bit uh, kind of soft. And then off we go for a hike. And here we go, off we go for a hike, wearing our fantastic uh, safety suits. These are Mustang suits we wear sometimes, depending on how cold and wet it is. Uh, and off we go, cruising across the ice, uh, exploring. And I showed this photo earlier. Uh, but it is a great demonstration. Uh, we're getting ready for kayaking. And so uh, we're going to climb off the side of the Australis there. And you can see uh, where Ben is standing in the grey jacket. Uh, that's where you're going to step down into the Zodiac. Uh, lots of hands to help, uh, but it is about a foot and a half or a foot, I guess, step down on the pontoon. Um, so lots of hands to help. And then you'll slide gracefully into your kayak. And away you go, paddling in a landscape of ice and mountains. Another fantastic thing we do, uh, if the weather is kind, is we get our camps out, our, our tents, and we pitch camp. And we spend one or two or up to even three nights if we want to uh, on the ice. I find on average we get uh, one night of camping in. And if we get some really keen beans, then we might do another one. It just depends on the weather uh, and the keenness of the team uh, as to whether they want to go camping all the time. Um, we do only camp in safe weather. Uh, and by safe, I mean, uh, Conditions that allow us to get home to the ship. Uh, I don't like being separated from my uh, my comforts on board. Uh, so we're very careful around that. Uh, but camping is an amazing experience. Uh, to spend the night out listening to penguins, uh, to sit in your own solitude on the shoreline, uh, and it's a chance on our very small boats uh, to get away from people perhaps uh, on these expeditions. And just kind of throwing back to that painting that we, I showed before from uh, Edward Wilson. Uh, when I first went to Antarctica, uh, I took this photograph from my very first year. Uh, and of all the photos of wildlife and icebergs and high glamour that I've taken over the years, and I'm an okay photographer, not a great one, but okay. Uh, I like this, I think, the most, because it really gets across to me the, the wilderness and the wildness and the feel uh, of a cold Southern Ocean. Uh, and the cold land of Antarctica rearing off into the fog. Uh, and it really just harkens back to that feeling that Ed Wilson tried to get across in the painting. Um, and for that, I love it. And it reminds me of that first year, that first mystery that I was experiencing. So I hope you're excited. Uh, I hope that uh, I've raised some questions for you. Um, but I really love Antarctica. I love traveling there. I love the deepness of connection with place that we have. When we go there, I love the sitting still on you know, the ice at a camp or maybe on the top of the boat for a few hours in the evening and just being at home in Antarctica, having come so far to be so still for a moment in the peace uh, of a place uh, with no borders uh, and of a place that is purely for peace and science uh, and the living creatures that are bound there. Um, that's all for me, folks. Um, I think I have a little bit of time for questions. Um, I hope you've enjoyed uh, hearing about Antarctica, seeing a few photographs, getting excited, uh, and maybe I've helped uh, articulate perhaps the different ways that we can go there. 
Um, I know that this season, uh, we've still had a couple of berths available on our boats, uh, which is actually a rarity at this time of the year. We're usually booked out well in advance, but um, due to a few things, uh, we actually have a few extra berths available. So if you're excited enough to book one, um, I know there's some very competent and lovely people who would love to talk to you about that. Uh, but certainly I'd love to see all of you down there. Maybe not 135 of you this season, um, but we can we can take it in turns perhaps. Uh, anyway, thanks everybody. Um, and I'll, I'll hand it back uh, to our admin here and, uh, and uh, we'll see what questions we have. Thank you. All right, Daniel, thank you so much. Now, before I start in with the question and answer session, I would like to remind everyone that you can submit your questions via the question field in your control panel. So um, let's get to some questions here. So how long is the boat trip uh, from uh, to Antarctica? Okay, so I'm gonna take this question as uh, how long is the travel time between South America and Antarctica? Uh, Correct. And that's approximately three days. Um, it could be slightly quicker, okay? But generally it doesn't blow out much more than that. Um, it's about 600 nautical miles, um, and we do about eight knots, which is about eight nautical miles an hour. Um, so we do uh, we do get across there efficiently, uh, with sails up, engines on, um, but it takes about three days to sail across the Drake Passage. And can I take a plane there? And if I do, will I be waiting for the boat to arrive? <laughs> Great question. Uh, so yes, you can fly a plane across. Um, so in the middle of the presentation there, I showed a couple of photos of a, uh, a penguin plane. And that plane flies across and it takes about two hours uh, to get across, two and a half, maybe three hours to get across the Drake. So three hours rather than three days. Um, and the boat will be there to meet you. Uh, so different trips, uh, you know, all, all the passengers, uh, all the guests on that particular trip will fly together or they'll all sail together uh, on the boat. Uh, so you just have to pick which trip you want to do, and they run at different times throughout the season. Uh, the fly fly trips, which is you fly in, fly out, fly sail, which means you fly in, sail out, and the sail fly, which means you sail in and fly out. I think I've got that correct. Thanks, Rob. Great, thank you so much for that. So, what is the chance is of us seeing whales on one of these trips? The chances of seeing whales are very high. Uh, so uh, Southern Ocean and Southern Hemisphere humpback whales are migrating uh, south as we speak. They're on their way now. They're actually, some of them are cruising past uh, my house down here in Tasmania. Uh, a lot of them are cruising past Patagonia uh, and they are cruising down south for the feeding season, for the, the food season. Uh, and so the Antarctic Peninsula um, by mid-December we'll have many, many, many humpback whales, uh, all displaying behaviors, uh, mostly at this time of the year when we're gonna be there, of voracious feeding, because they are hungry. Uh, and some of the calves uh, you'll see will never have had a square meal yet. They'll only have had mother's milk. And so it's their first taste of Antarctic krill, which is the main food source. So yes, it's a very, very high chance of us seeing whales. That's very exciting. <laughs> so. It is. Do all the ships in itineraries include kayaking? Uh, I believe the sail vessels do. Uh, I have to confirm on the third one. Uh, that is uh, the motor vessel. Uh, but certain sail vessels we have kayaking on board, yes. And if I'm nervous uh, to use a kayak, are there Zodiacs available? Yeah. So uh, all the activities that we do, uh, all in, whether it's a hike or a kayak, whatever it is, uh, it's a both a voluntary activity. You don't have to do it, uh, which is one of the advantages of the small boat experience. We can customize to you. Uh, and secondly, we'll always try and provide uh, an alternative that is more comfortable for you. Uh, so if we're out going kayaking and either you don't feel comfortable or maybe you just don't feel like it that day, maybe you prefer uh, to focus on your photography perhaps, Yes, we have a, a safety zodiac that's riding at the same time as the kayaking, uh, and you're more than welcome to ride in the safety zodiac, um, which is often a good fun chance just to chat with one of the crew who's driving it, perhaps the first mate or the captain or even the cook. Uh, it can be quite fun just to hang out with them for a, a couple of hours. Uh, so the answer is yes, yes. You, if you're uncomfortable, there are always options. 
how does the zodiac get through the ice? Uh, depending on how thick the ice is. Uh, so on a day like this, in this photograph you can see in front of you, um, we are cruising through open water. Uh, if the ice is thicker, we can push through to a degree. Okay, if it's any thicker than that, we just don't go in there. Um, there are many fantastic stories of ships and small boats getting stuck in the ice, uh, and that's not gonna be our story. Uh, we're not going to get stuck in the ice. So uh, we can push through a limited amount of ice in a Zodiac. And again, a limited amount of ice in our sail vessels. We are not icebreakers. We can't break hard formed ice. Uh, but we can push through some ice. Uh, some, but not a kind of sealed layer, layer of ice, if that makes sense. Great, thank you. So how many land expeditions will we end up doing each day? Great question. Uh, so on any given day, uh, we might get off the ship once, twice, three times, okay, or no times. Uh, so on any given day, we are exploring. Uh, and we, we might use a small boat, we might use our boat, we might use our feet, we might use kayaks. These are all different methods for exploring. Uh, I try and get off the boat twice if I can, okay, go for two different activities if I can, Okay, uh, however, it could be much, much more than that. Okay, or it could be a bit less, uh, depends on the day. Um, you can get the feel already that it's quite a fluid expedition. Uh, it's not uh, like some other uh, itineraries you might be more used to perhaps, where there's an itemized uh, list of things we're gonna do and see. We are there to uh, capitalize on what Antarctica gives us. Uh, so if Antarctica gives us perfect weather, okay, and clear waters, then we'll, we'll go right into that and take advantage of that. If Antarctica is windy and, and icy, we might stay on board and drink hot chocolate and, you know, and talk about, you know, our adventures. Um, and both of those things are amazing experiences. And it's Antarctica telling us what we're going to experience rather than us telling it what we're going to have. Uh, and I quite like that. But certainly the answer is, uh, ideally in a perfect world, we're going to get off the boat twice a day, have a couple of hours on shore, you know, one to three hours doing something. So how close can we get to the penguins? <laughs> uh, how close can you get to the penguins? Uh, so we operate uh, under some very strict uh, biosecurity uh, and uh, biological kind of welfare rules. Uh, we operate under the Antarctic Treaty. Uh, essentially for penguins, uh, we can approach up to five meters uh, from most penguins. Uh, if they're molting, as in their feathers are coming out, um, or they have young chicks, we'll stay a bit further away. Five meters is about 15 feet. Um, there is a little thing at the moment, which I'll just kind of flag uh, as a, a factor, and that is you may have heard of avian bird flu. Uh, an avian bird flu uh, is a, uh, a flu, it's a virus that has uh, run rampant through Northern Hemisphere bird colonies particularly ocean bird colonies because seabirds migrate and move so much between colonies. Uh, and it has arrived in South America in a big, big, big bad way. Uh, and it has not yet arrived in Antarctica. Um, and we will clean all of our gear. Uh, we'll do a big biosecurity uh, before we land. We'll clean our boots. We'll check all of our gear, uh, all those kind of things. Um, oh, I'm just going to close this one second, guys. There we go. Uh, so ensure we don't bring that down with us. Um, but because of the presence of that virus, uh, we do be quite careful about approaching wildlife. Um, and if they approach us, which is a fantastic experience, uh, at the present, we need to move away from the wildlife to avoid any possibility of us passing on a contagion. Um, so it's just one little extra wrinkle that is in our story this year. But five metres, 15 feet uh, is the closest we can get to, to wildlife, which is a challenge sometimes because there is so much of it. So if nobody owns Antarctica, how do we protect it from harmful human enterprises? What pre prevents anyone from just going to touch a penguin as well? Great question. And that's one for perhaps a cup of tea or a glass of whiskey uh, on the Australis in the evening. Um, it is the, the multi-bazillion dollar question in Antarctica. Uh, the short answer is, is that the Antarctic, uh, Antarctic continent uh, and the oceans around it uh, are governed by the Antarctic Treaty. Uh, and the treaty is ratified by signatory nations, of which Australia and the US uh, are two. 
uh, in fact, two of the original eight uh, of that, uh, that treaty. Um, and so the best way for us to preserve Antarctica uh, is to support the treaty, uh, to uh, encourage good behaviour amongst tourists by travelling with, with an organisation like NATHAB. Um, we are going down there as members of IATO, and IATO is the International Association of Antarctic Treaty Operators, which is a fantastic acronym. Um, but any uh, tour operator that goes down under that banner is going down with very strict protocols. And the more we travel with those companies, the companies that abide by that, those protocols, uh, the more we can uh, look after the wildlife and ensure that future tourism uh, is responsible uh, and caring for the environment. So you mentioned having a glass of whiskey to, to have a discussion about this. So there is wine, beer, and whiskey on board the boat? <laughs> uh, good question. Uh, so the, the boat will provide uh, some wine and, and with dinner uh, and some beer with dinner, that kind of thing. Um, uh, but if you would like to have things like whiskey or gin, uh, that's a, a bring your own thing. So we provide uh, wine and beer for dinner. Um, and perhaps a few extra surprises along the way. Uh, but uh, we do have time in Punta Aranas and Ushuaia. If you want a glass of whiskey, for example, you can you can purchase something to bring with you. Uh, my apologies for the false advertising there uh, on that one. Thank you for clarifying that. Unfortunately, <laughs> Daniel, that is going to be the last question that we do have time for today. So I would like to throw it back to you for any closing comments you may have for us. Um, I would just like everyone for the, to thank everyone for their interest. Uh, taking their time with me and listening to my my accent. I hope you all understood me. I was trying to speak my best American. Uh, and uh, I hope you all enjoyed seeing uh, some of the photos that, are, that I've taken. Um, I very deliberately chose to show photos that I think are totally achievable. There is no wildlife experience that I took a photo of that I think you won't have. Uh, I think you'll have far better photographs than my photographs. Uh, in fact, I can almost guarantee that. Uh, I very deliberately chose the photos so it was a very realistic presentation of what Antarctica is for you. Um, it's an amazing place. Uh, it's a privilege to have been there uh, so many times like I have. Um, and I really want to share uh, what it's like to be at home in the most remote, most wild, uh, you know, most, uh, most everything continent uh, in the world. Thank you. Daniel, thank you so much for taking the time to present for us today. And I'd also like to thank everyone who tuned in today. Now, if you are interested in information on how you can travel with NatHab, please give us a call at the number on your screen, or you can send us an email at info at nathab.com. Our adventure specialists are happy to help you out. Join us tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links on our website at nathab.com slash webinars. We did record today's presentation and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I will conclude the webinar. Goodbye, everybody. We'll see you next time.